This week on The Inside Story, a free press matters. From a massacre at a local newspaper to surging disinformation in Kenya and Ukraine, journalists around the world are under fire with violence on the rise. How are they coping and what could this mean for local and international reporting? Now, The Inside Story, a free press matters. journalists, we try to avoid being the story, but increasingly hostility and attacks mean media have to speak out. The news we cover and events in communities, even our own newsrooms, can leave a permanent mark. Which is why we're coming to you today from Annapolis in Maryland, home of the US Naval Academy and just 50 miles from Washington DC. I'm Jessica Jareep. Welcome to the Inside Story. On June 28, 2018, a gunman entered the Capital Gazette newsroom here in Annapolis, Maryland, killing five and injuring two others. The incident is one of the worst attacks on media in the United States. As the fifth anniversary approaches, VOA's Christina Caseda smith spoke with journalists from the Gazette about how that day has shaped their lives. Uh, several fatalities and several people there in the hospital. It was an act of violence that took the lives of five staff at Annapolis newspaper, the Capital Gazette, and changed the lives of those who survived. No gear falls on my watch. Including photojournalist Paul Gillespie. And I'm sitting at my computer and I heard a loud crash, a loud shot, you know, and then a crash of glass and it was him shooting through the front door. Amid the chaos, emergency lights, the yellow tape and the influx of first responders, Journalists from the Gazette gather in the back of a colleague's truck and started writing. In July 2021, the shooter, who said he was upset at the newspaper's coverage of him, was found criminally responsible. He will serve life in prison for the murders. But for Gillespie, the memories of that day are still vivid. And when I'm feeling really bad, it feels like I'm just waiting to die, waiting for, you know, waiting for what should have happened to me that day to, you know, catch up to me. The DART Center for Journalism and Trauma at New York's Columbia University says that 80% of reporters have been exposed to work-related traumatic events. And groups like the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker record hundreds of assaults and threats against media. For Gillespie, the shooting marked a before and after in his personal life and his career. You know, so I do get nervous about going to things. And for a while after the, the shootings, even, even now, like they think twice about sending me to a, like um, a vigil or something for somebody who's been shot, because around here, whenever somebody mentions gun violence, they all talk about the Capitol Gazette. His former colleague, Rachel Pachella, is another survivor, a reporter. Pachella covered the Anne Arundel County school system, public land access, and obituaries for children. I was just very naturally curious as a child. Um, I loved reading the paper. Um, and once I tried it out in high school, interning at my local paper, you know, I really didn't see myself doing anything else. Um, I loved going and telling stories. The day of the shooting, Pachella was inside the newsroom. That event changed her life, but it also taught her something about herself. You know, it really taught me perseverance, um, you know, to continue on after that. Just like the aisle from him. Parcella only recently stopped working at the Annapolis newspaper to pursue a career in communications. But the experience made her reflect on the security of journalists in the U.S. As work went remote, um, you know, I, I suppose there's no longer like a central target. But I, I do worry about, um, you know, how a journalist would keep themselves safe, you know, in their own home without any kind of support or resources from other people. In Annapolis, the Guardians of the First Amendment Memorial honors the five lives lost. Gerald Fishman, Rob Heisen, John McNamara, Rebecca Smith and Wendy Winters. 
really only her I did it. Gillespie I mean, too is honoring his Capital Gazette family so through an exhibition. Drive up here from Lake. What was great about my project here is all around us is I got to talk to every one of these people making these pictures. Like they would come to my studio and for an hour, hour and a half, we would have like what I consider to be like mini therapy sessions between us. I, you know. The idea for the exhibition came when Gillespie was struggling, but a documentary on a photographer he admired brought inspiration. I want to try that, you know. So I cleared out space in my basement and I made a studio. And I was like, who can I photograph? And I said, well, my Capital Gazette family are always taking pictures of themselves. Gillespie is the last photojournalist at the Gazette from that 2018 newsroom. He still goes out on assignments and is committed to local journalism. And the people that are doing the job, because we are not the enemy of the people. We are your neighbors. We're your sons, your daughters, your, you know, your parents out there just trying to... The Cristina Caicedo-Smith, VOA News, Annapolis. As we just saw, journalists here are still healing from the events of that day. The physical dangers for journalists out on assignment are well documented. But increasingly, the media community is looking at the emotional toll of covering violence and tragedy. We take you now to VOA's New York Bureau, where Christina spoke with Hannah Storm. She's the co-founder of the Headlines Network and a specialist in mental health and media safety. Specifically talking about mental health and you know, how journalists cope with um, you know, violence and being victims sometimes of a violent crime. What is the conversation that media uh, managers are having? I think we've seen the conversation around mental health in journalism change quite significantly in the last couple of decades. Um, we went from a situation where there were very many taboos, a lot of stigma around any admissions of vulnerability. This idea that we had to be really macho, we had to any admission of vulnerability was an admission of failure, which is obviously wrong. So we've seen this change in conversation over the past decade, couple of decades, um, really to the point where there's more of a realization in newsrooms that we need to address and acknowledge and normalize conversations around mental health and the impact of our work on us. And that can be across a whole spectrum from witnessing and, take and experiencing really violent experiences or trauma through to conversations about the other impact of our work and our, and our personal lives on our mental health. Yes, when you have a reporter covering you know, uh, a war or you're covering a very violent city, how um, do you address that you know, mental health at the same time balancing uh, your work? Sure, I think it's really important to acknowledge actually that mental health and mental safety and well-being is the other side of the coin from physical safety and physical health. We can't have one without the other. So this is about helping journalists uh, feel more empowered, I suppose, to do their jobs because they're recognized that the mental health is, is, is important. Um, there are a few different things, and I'd acknowledge that I'm a journalist by background and not a clinician. But from speaking with hundreds of journalists the past few years and having had my own experience of post-traumatic stress, there are certain things that I think are, as we call them, protective. And I think one is a sense of understanding why we're doing our job. We're bearing witness. You know, we're holding power to account. We're striving to, uh, to end injustice. So that bearing witness is important. The other thing I'd say is that connecting with people who we trust, having a community around us who we can speak with about our mental health is super important too. From the newsroom leader side, I'd say that we need to kind of see this as a holistic conversation around physical safety and mental health, but also conversation around what do we do to support our journalists in advance? So what's the risk assessment like? How might they be impacted from mental health side? What are we doing to support them during the coverage of the story? or during the situation, and what are we doing afterwards? And I think there's two more things which are really important to say is, one is, it's normal for us to have a reaction to a difficult situation. It's our body and brain kind of going, this is weird, this is unacceptable, and dealing with that, so that's important to note. And it's also important to note that journalists are resilient. Data and research shows us that journalists are resilient, that doesn't mean that journalists are immune though. I had the opportunity to talk to some of the survivors of the Capitol Gazette shooting. Uh, this year is going to be five years uh, since that incident occurred. 
And one of the things that one of the reporters mentioned was that he initially tried to block it. You know, it was uh, when he was going out to cover stories or to take photos and, you know, he had to go out and um, cover a crime scene or, you know, this type of incident, he usually tried to block it. Is that a good strategy or not? I think it's everybody has different coping strategies. Like everybody has mental health, but has it in different ways, right? I think it's, um, I would strongly encourage people to seek help if they feel they need to. I've been through therapy. I've been in therapy for many, many years. Um, and I think being able to speak with somebody who's a clinician is super important. I would say that some news organizations are doing great stuff, fantastic stuff. They've got peer support networks, employee assistance programs. They offer therapy, they op offer webinars and conversations, effective communication. But, I, but there are two other things I'd say is, one is that I feel like, you know, what makes journalism great is the sense of connection and sense of empathy. We connect with our sources and our stories. We amplify their experiences. Those same soft skills can be used within our newsrooms. We should have empathy and connection around our colleagues to simply ask them, how are you? Are you okay? Are you really okay? What worries me is we're losing people who are burnt out. We're losing people, diverse people, um, you know, people from diverse backgrounds who we need in our newsrooms because they feel unheard and they feel marginalized and they feel unable to share their experiences. There's a lot of burnout happening. There's a lot of um, anxiety. There's a lot of depression, but this is not a kind of negative thing that we need to be. So what I'm saying is, I guess that journalism is a fantastic profession. We are resilient. We do have the tools to support us. We do have that kind of protective step back in terms of saying that, why are we doing this? We're doing this to bear witness. So I think that if we remind ourselves that, you know, it, things are positive, but I do still think there's work, more work to be done in the mental health space. Threats to journalists are a global issue. In Kenya, acts of violence and intimidation are on the rise against media members. The number of attacks went up during their last election cycle and continue to place them at risk. For VOA from Nairobi, Saeed Aswell spoke with media experts about how attacks on and offline put journalism at risk. Eric Center scrolls through images. They show a protest the NTV video journalist had been assigned to cover in late March. Organized by Kenya's opposition leader, Raila Odinga, protesters rallied against the cost of living but what started as a peaceful event soon turned chaotic. The tables actually was thrown on us. We were coughing that moment. I remember telling my crew members, we were actually four of us up there. So I was telling my, uh, my fellow camera person, please, let's, let's just go down. It has never been this way. The journalists had their equipment on top of a vehicle, searching for the perfect shot when police approached and fired tear gas in their direction. The moment I just turned this side to pick my camera because it was hanging, it's when I was hit by this tear gas. That's when. Then I didn't know what happened from there. I found. I just found myself on the on the on the tarmac. The first thing I I saw when I gained my conscious is the is my my old bed, my four months kid child anyway. Let me say the child and my wife. The Media Council of Kenya took up his case and others. We have written to the Inspector General of Police and we have documented the case. We are actually following up the cases one by one. Kenya's Inspector General of Police apologized after the protests and said any malpractice will be dealt with. The Media Council is also working to ensure journalists have access to newsworthy events, including the exhumation of members of a cult found in a mass grave. Authorities tried to restrict access for the press, says Omoyo. I told the government the approach is unacceptable, but I told them that we understand what you're going through. Please put up a media center and organize regular briefings. Whenever you shut down media that we can see, you open the floodgates of rumors, and then rumors will kill a country because people now lack verifications and uh, legitimacy. Kenya's Interior Ministry told VOA that because of the active investigation into mass graves, the area is off limits to unauthorized people. And while media were initially denied access, 
A pool system has been set up to allow one reporter and one cameraman to have authorized access each day. Kenya is seeing the same surge in this and misinformation witnessed globally, said media experts. There's been quite a lot of misinformation, a lot of it exacerbated at the height of the pandemic. And we see that the effects of that uh, even to date. For Isinta, the scars from his protest assignments are a reminder of a narrow escape. And you see, this is the eye that I usually use for my every every camera person. This is what I use for my daily activities. So when it is it, my only gratitude that I'm alive, and I can see my family. That's the only point. That's the only important thing now for my life. The experience underscores too the dangers media confront on a regular basis. For VOA, Saida Swale in Nairobi, Kenya. It's not just threats from attacks and disinformation. Globally, we're witnessing the steady decline of civil liberties and democracies, which affect press freedom. Even here in the United States, the First Amendment, which guarantees freedom of speech, is not immune. Eileen O'Reilly, president of the National Press Club and managing editor of Standards and Training at Axios, spoke with VOA about her views on press freedom here in the United States. Well, I do worry about the state of press freedom in the United States. It is such a pillar of our democracy and I feel is being eroded by these cases and you know, being tipped away by people trying to restrict the rights uh, to freedom of information. So that is definitely a concern that we are constantly amplifying that, you know, what a danger that is to our democracy. I still believe that most of the American people understand how important journalism is to their democracy, that they rely on journalists to bring them the news of what's happening and why it matters to them. Um, I'm hopeful there's always been cases where you know people either dismiss the importance of journalists or they actually take violent actions against them because they're trying to repress the information and they want to control the message. But that is something that I'm hopeful that most Americans will understand should never be supported. America is very fortunate to have that First Amendment rights. And we sometimes I think we take it for granted, but we shouldn't. If you look overseas, a lot of other countries do not have that type of protection. Without having journalists who can tell you what's happening, then who's going to hold our leaders, our business people, our landowners, our our regulators accountable to what they're supposed to be doing, to what our taxpayer money is going towards them doing, and towards you know what is best for the community. Everyone needs to know you know what's happening so they can make their own decision and take part in their society. Earlier, we saw the violence that Kenyan journalists confront for doing little more than their jobs. But what happens when journalists switch from media to military and take up arms in a conflict they once covered? That's exactly what's happening in Ukraine following Russia's invasion last year. We head now to Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, where Anna Chernikova and US-based Veronica Balderas Iglesias bring us this story of an American reporter turned soldier. With Russia's war in Ukraine waged in the information space as well as on the ground, some journalists have gone from reporting about the front lines to literally defending them. Sarah Ashton Cirillo is a US journalist who reported for LGBTQ plus media before signing up to Ukraine's military. The turning point for Ashton Cirillo, evidence of war crimes in the city of Kharkiv. I said, am I better serving democracy as a journalist or can I do more as a soldier for the armed forces of Ukraine? And after much deliberation, discussions with my senior officers, other journalists, I felt that being in the army suited the service to freedom better than remaining as a journalist. It's a decision many Ukrainian journalists grapple with. Several have swapped newsrooms for the front line, 
says Serhii Tomilenko, president of the National Union of Journalists of Ukraine. Covering the war as a journalist is risky enough. At least 14 lost their lives on assignment in Ukraine, including AFP photojournalist Armen Soldin, killed in May near the city of Bakhmut, a center of intense fighting. But fighting the war is much riskier. Around 40 journalists who left the media for the Ukrainian military have been killed on the battlefield, says Tomilenko. For us, every death of every media worker, whether during the performance of their professional duties or when our colleagues die as civilian victims or as mobilized heroes, it is a tragedy for us. Whether as a journalist or a junior sergeant in Ukraine's armed forces, Ashton Cirillo says she wants to defend freedom. It wasn't so much that I moved from fighting for freedom as a journalist to fighting for freedom as a soldier, because journalists truly engage in making certain that the world is a free place. Alongside her military role, Ashton Cirillo is active on social media, where Russian propaganda is rife. But she says artificial intelligence tools such as ChatGPT offer a way to counter that disinformation. We're able to help counter the Russian propaganda, help counter the Russian narratives, because we have fact-based information uh, arriving into our hands in a much quicker way. Ultimately, AI will never replace the human being. For Tomilenko, the priority is ensuring media have access. There are indeed certain limitations when covering military events. There are certain press services that call on not covering something, expecting official speakers to comment later. But in general, we do not see such a global atmosphere of censorship and restrictions. In most Ukrainian and international media, we see the same truth of the war. Cruel, scary, but still a picture of reality. Ashton Cirillo says Ukraine has a large, vocal group of LGBTQ plus fighters. And in the case of myself and the other out trans uh, woman who is fighting, we happen to be on the front, we happen to be a bit more visible. But ultimately, everyone can take their level of visibility and use it to strengthen democracy and to strengthen LGBTQ rights. And in Tomlenko's view, whether in the media or the military, Ukrainian journalists are fulfilling their duty. With reporting from Anna Chernikova in Kyiv, Veronica Valderas Iglesias, VOA News. The Ukraine war continues altering the landscape of that country, but other places are no stranger to violence against journalists. Take Afghanistan, where following the Taliban takeover just two years ago, women journalists have quite literally run for their lives. Lima Spalesi had a long career in media, including as an anchor hosting current affairs programs. But all that changed after the collapse of Kabul. She fled to neighboring Pakistan late last year and tells us in her own words what life is like for female journalists under a repressive regime. In Afghanistan, the main challenge for media is that they are under complete control and censorship. Media have no freedom. There is no freedom of expression. The current rulers of Afghanistan somehow control all the media, and they do not allow reports about what is happening in the country or what people want aired. The current rulers use media as a loudspeaker for their propaganda. In Afghanistan, what the people want covered is how the Taliban treat people, what the facts are, and how people live. These are what the people want the media to air. Unfortunately, media have neither the right nor the permission to broadcast what the people want. They cannot air reports that are based on fact or reflect people's lives. Unfortunately, no media can air what the people want. Freedom of the media means building a bridge between the people and the government. Free media can prevent corruption in the government and society, reflect the truth, can make reports and have programs on it. Unfortunately, under the current government, the media do not have freedom. That's all for now. I'm Jessica Dreet in Annapolis, Maryland. As we close out this week's episode, we want to highlight the plight of two fellow American journalists. The Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich, who is still being detained in Russia, and freelancer Austin Tice, who was kidnapped in Syria back in 2012 and has been missing for over a decade. 
As we leave you, we honour the five members of the Capital Gazette who lost their lives here in Annapolis in 2018. I'm Jessica Dream. See you next week on The Inside Story.